All right, well, thanks Michael for joining me. So let's just kind of set the ground rules of what we're gonna to try to accomplish over the next many videos, many weeks. Um, we both very much love to talk about hot topics, things that are part of culture, part of theology, uh, but one of the trends that we consistently see now in our culture is uh, really an inability to communicate about topics that there might be disagreement on. Uh, I think one of the most clear examples of it is, is social media. Social media in this generation has given us a glimpse into people's minds and hearts like nothing else because everything's coming out. And, and what we're seeing is people don't know how to, to argue or, or how to discuss or how to debate without it being really harsh or deal breaker, relationship ending. And so for you and I who love communicating, we love talking about this, we just decided we we're gonna sit down and, uh, and honestly model conversation, not in an arrogant way like, oh, we have it solved, but to give people a, a glimpse on the fact that you can talk about difficult topics in a way that doesn't hurt a relationship. And so what we've decided, like, again, this could be, uh, so you and I, we have a rhythm where we're coming through when we're talking to each other and we'll say, we begin the conversation saying, this could be a really bad idea. <laughs> and I think almost every conversation starts that way. This could be a bad idea, it could be a good idea. So here's what could be a bad idea, it could be a good idea, is we're gonna pick just seven or eight of the most hot topics right now in our culture. And over the next however many videos we do, we're just gonna start addressing those topics and talk about it from a different perspective to give people really a, an insight into it. Because sometimes we just don't have the, the full picture. Yeah, 100%. And I think something we talked about years ago at this point, um, we were talking about social media in general and it's given people a volume of platform that's kind of unprecedented. Right. So pre-social media, you have influence over your like specific friend group. Like these are the people I hang out with, we talk about these five things and we like conversate and we go back and forth. Social media happens and all of a sudden your opinion has way more reach than it ever had prior to social media. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you're like a community leader or something like that with a platform. And I think when something like that happens, you have a lot of people all of a sudden with the ability to speak up, the ability mm -hmm. to have thoughts heard on a big level, but not necessarily understand the social context of how to do it appropriately. Right. And I just say that from my perspective. So I grew up as a millennial with social media. Like I was in junior high when that whole thing happened. So I grew up with this sense of, well, my voice has value because I had a platform for that voice, but I never learned how to maintain that. So mm -hmm. something that we talk about, like one of my, you, you mentioned this I think a couple weeks ago now, but I can't stop thinking about it was, on social media, people, their base level from starting an opinion will already be so aggressive for someone to even engage in it, they have to kind of buck up to it. Right. So someone opening, it could be really simple. And this is coming from someone who I use a lot of exagger exaggerated language. It's like, yeah. we're running jokes like, this is the greatest thing that's ever yeah, happened. Yeah, you speak in superlatives. Yeah, oh, nonstop. This is, <laughs> this is the worst thing that's ever happened my whole life. This this muffin changed my life. <laughs> like, stuff that, of course, that's untrue. So, so even from that perspective, but people oftentimes will engage in really serious topics that way. So like a small like example would be someone on Facebook saying something along the lines of, well, this is the problem with, with this country, fill in the blank with their opinion. Right. It's like, you've already set the bar so high to engage yeah, in that this conversation. This is the problem. Of the hundreds of problems, that's <laughs> right. the one, or like, man, or, or, or even if you can subtly change that to, here's what I'm seeing freaks me out. I think it's right. wrong. What do you guys think? Like right. all of a sudden you've changed the whole landscape of a conversation. And I think that's where this whole, I could be wrong. That's going to be the win. It's not that you and I have mastered this concept because we certainly haven't. Like I said, I still, you know, I'm terrible at this in a whole lot of ways, but just to exemplify, we can disagree, which you and I don't see eye to eye on everything in the whole world. Sure. You know, we're pretty like-minded, but, but we, we disagree, but showing that you can disagree, show you can take a new ideas and show that you can walk in with this idea of I could be wrong and that not be a weak thing. Yeah. That not that not be failure. If anything, something to be celebrated. Yeah. So the, this is this whole video that we're doing. This one and, and the following weeks. This is the theme. I could be wrong, and it. This comes from a. So to our church, will be familiar because in a series I did on reconciliation, I use that phrase. It was actually the title of that message, but it actually comes from a habit that I have when I'm meeting with people where there could be tension. So being a pastor, being a leader, there are times. I don't see eye to eye, people don't see eye to eye with me or they have questions and they come into the, my office and I'll say, right in the beginning of the meeting, I said, can we, can we both have the exact same mindset? And here's the mindset, I could be wrong. So not you could be wrong, I could be wrong. And because I think we do communicate typically from a, from a platform of I'm right, prove me wrong. And that's actually like, you know, there's a, a guy who has a video where he does a bunch of videos where he just says a, a bold statement and says, prove me wrong. 
that's that's his his theme and stuff. It can be very interesting. But I'm saying that's how the average person communicates now is I'm yeah. right, prove me wrong. Versus when I say to people, if you can come in and have an attitude that says I could be wrong, then we're gonna we're gonna have an ability to have humility in that, and so we're gonna feel a little bit more safe, and we're going to work toward reconciliation or or some type of compromise or just clarity in the relationship, even if we have to agree to disagree. This mindset allows us to get there. Versus when someone comes in, I mean, we both know it. When someone is is fired up and they're just defending their position at all costs it's almost impossible to find any yeah. type of common ground. And, and that's what, like when you said about on social media, people begin at such an elevated state, yeah. it's hard to engage that. So like for me as, as a boss, I've actually had to tell employees through the years, every time I want to talk to you, I have to buck up to talk to you because yeah. you're getting fired up and you're getting defensive. And I don't like bucking up to talk to an employee. I don't, yeah. and I don't want people to have to buck up to talk to me. Yeah. And so like, even in like in verbal communication or how we post, we have to take it down a notch and say, okay, there's a different way that we can communicate where we can actually work toward some commonality, but we can't do that if we don't have the right mindset. Yeah. And, you know, from my perspective, that's where I found in my life, probably the greatest growth. So you introduced this whole principle to me years ago when I started working here. I've been working for you for five years now. Um, And in that amount of time, I've learned that if, when you go into to a mentality of your value tied to your idea or your thought or your whatever you're debating, you dig in your heels because the moment you admit that you're wrong, now it feels like you've lost. Or now it feels like, like, like I'm less than or I have failed. And what you've taught me is that if you can manage to separate your, your value as a human from your thought, from your idea, from your political opinion, all of a sudden it literally, ha- it, I, I would legitimately say this and I 100% mean it. It's the closest thing that I feel like I have to like a superpower is this idea of like, <laughs> yeah, you've said that before. Yeah. I really believe it. Like, like I don't consider myself especially intelligent or well-spoken, but what I've gotten really good at is in a minute on the fly saying, Oh, I'm totally wrong. You're right. That's I'm now on your team. Mm-hmm. And that's like so liberating just to say like, that doesn't mean I'm dumb. Doesn't yes. mean I'm not intelligent. It doesn't mean that I don't have value or I didn't bring value to the conversation. If anything, all it really means is now I've walked away smarter. I've mm-hmm. walked away with a better idea. So even in my marriage, it's helped so much. Um, the moment that Gina says something and she makes like a point where it's like, oh, wow, yep, you're right. That's my fault. You know, then now before that, I was probably acting like like a crazy person. Like, you know, but the yeah. moment that I realized it, because I, I've detached value from that opinion. So mm-hmm. it's like, okay, that's a really good point. And then all of a sudden I can be right all over again, which we all want to be right. Sure. You know? And without doing that, I just think it makes us too closed minded, too closed off. And with it, man, I've learned so much volume so much in the last like three years because of this mentality Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, so we have one of our staff values is you are not your idea yeah like it's it's not you those are two separate things so we can we can shoot holes in an idea and not shoot holes in a person and and to separate that but i i think one of the things that you said that i think is so critical in our culture is coming into an argument and having a mindset that's saying I could be wrong, to a lot of people that would feel weak. Yeah. Because like if, if you are talking with someone and you really have a conviction and you believe something, and then all of a sudden you realize you're wrong, I think our culture has trained us to think like you made a mistake then before, so now you have failed and now that's being exposed. It feels super vulnerable. And what we've talked about recently is actually the, the mindset that I could be wrong and I want to find out where I'm wrong is actually the strong mindset. It's the strong position because the other flip side to that is if you are defending a position that's wrong or defending even your ignorance, then you are going to stay in a weak position because any type of area that you're wrong in, that's the weak spot. So to have a mindset to say, I just want to keep getting smarter. I want to keep growing. I want to keep learning that's the strong position. And that's what I think is so missing in our culture. So even when we, we see it on social media now, people post something and people respond. I mean, you, you know how you can tell you like within minutes, like it can tell you like this person posted 22 minutes ago and you see like a comment 23 minutes or, you know, or yeah. however that'd be 21 minutes. And you realize this is such a deep concept this person just posted and you responded that quickly. Yeah. Like you're just arguing and you're not even listening. You're, yeah. not, you're not saying, okay, what did that person mean? Why, why did they say that? And I think that's the danger of it is like we feel like we have to constantly show strength by by arguing opinions versus yeah. asking questions. 
And my dad, that's one of the most critical things that he taught me when I was a kid. And, and this is not in any way a compliment to me. My dad, <laughs> he just said, Matthew, you make too many statements. Yeah. He said, you need to ask oh, man, more questions. So and uh, he used to actually have a nickname for me, which I now find myself nicknaming like my kids when they do this. He would go, Matt, you're a prosecutor. Like you just are, man, you just go, you just go, you just go. And he said, you need to chill and ask some questions because you, you're not as smart as you think you are. And and here's the truth. We all think we are smarter than we yeah. actually are. Oh, for sure. And so this to have that posture to say, you know what? I The strong position is the position that says, I want to ask questions. I want to learn. I could be wrong. And I don't. I think we're missing that in our culture. Yeah, 100%. And I think it's, it's very easy to fall into this trap of you hit a certain age or you hit a certain season in life and you convince yourself that you have it figured out. Mm-hmm. And I think we were just talking to this about kids. So about kids, go because I remember, you know, my kids are super young, so I haven't experienced that with my yeah. you know, two-year-old yet, but you know, I'm sure I will someday. But kids in general have this have this feeling where they'll hit a certain age where they think they're right all the time about everything nonstop. That's mm-hmm. just their, right. their standard. They've learned a lot. And then what you said, and it blew my mind, was at some point you transitioned from that phase back into, oh, wait, I'm probably wrong. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and letting that be the immediate posture of like, almost humility of like, I'm probably wrong. Like, yeah. like someone has to have the better idea. I'm really curious to know what it is. And the consequence of not doing that, all of a sudden years go by and you, your mind continues to close off. Um, and something I mentioned to you recently is that you can tell very quickly when people are done taking in new ideas. Yeah, They've reached a season in life where they've realized, I know my 15 things, their core values to me, this is what I believe. I'm not taking in new stuff. And the danger of that is all of a sudden, 10 years, 20 years, all this time goes by, you're not taking in new information and you have the same thoughts. And it really is, to me, what feels like the death of human potential, which feels very exaggerated. Mm-hmm. But think about that. The human potential, you have like endless opportunity to grow, to learn new things, to take in new ideas, to, to gain new wisdom. And when you take that stance, it could be subconscious, it could be on purpose, but of like, no, I'm not taking in new stuff, you lose all that potential. It's For off sure. the table now. I've lost the potential for growth. I've lost the potential to learn new things. Versus if you could go back when you're a kid, you, you're understanding like, like, oh wow, like I'm soaking up information. You're asking your parents a billion questions. You become a teenager. It's like, well, now I know it all. If you stay there and don't go back to that season of like, oh, I'm probably wrong with stuff, you lose all that possibility. Yeah, and, and you think about it, like even in your head, if you just start jumping back decades, so like you're in your mid 20s, I'm 40, uh, 41. If we just kind of jump back a decade, you realize how much we've grown as a culture of learning things. So like what you just said about not taking in new information, it would be the same as a person just freezing how they dress, the automobile they drive, like all the technology from, like can you imagine if someone's just like, well here, we have a perfect example. The Amish in our community have just picked a time period and said this is how we're gonna stay. And for some people, that's their intellectual reality. Is they're just not progressing in any way. And, And that was a statement, like I have referenced this, so if people have been connected to my Bible studies or whatever, I've referenced that statement numerous times that you said because it was the ultimate like one one sentence summary of the problem. You said because we were talking about a specific situation, this person was arguing and arguing and arguing, had no foot to stand on, and you said they are no longer taking in new information. And I just thought about man, it, to be described that way would be devastating to me. A heartbreak because yeah. for on many levels, on on just like the the impractical side of it of like, I'm, I'm now stunted in my growth. But also what I recognize, if I'm no longer taking in new information, then I am probably damaging a lot of people in my Man, life. Yeah. Because I'm not listening to any other perspective. I'm not listening to any other, like if you're in a marriage and you're not taking in new information, if you're a father <laughs> and not taking in new information, yeah. if you're a worker, I mean, if you're yeah. an employer, employee and not taking in new information, like there is just a, behind you, there is wreckage everywhere you go. Yeah. And you don't even realize it because you're not taking in new information. Yeah. And, and I think that's what's so dangerous. Is that's what I'm seeing now as a pastor is all these people are arguing and not taking in the other person's perspective and not touching their heart. And so as a result, they're just wounding people. Yeah. And, and this yeah, is yeah. one of the things that I, I've learned, and I've been really open about this uh, in the ministry and talking about it. But in my marriage, um, I used to win every argument with Mary. And, and I, mm. in arrogance, thought, I was doing her a favor because we were fighting for truth. I, I thought the ultimate goal was truth. What I did not realize, and she literally said, said it to me years later, really calm. And I actually think when someone says something calm, it actually stings a little bit more. You know, like you always want to fight up. Yeah. And she just said calmly, I could win arguments if I wanted, or something along the lines, or like, 
Um, I didn't lose that argument. I gave up. I think that's how she worded Which, it. Which, like, knowing Mary, who's one of the most peaceful, calm, intelligent people that I know, that, that's got to hit home. And I, I <laughs> stared at her in the room. Like, I have the memory still. Yeah. I stared at her in the room and was, and I'm not exaggerating, I was heartbroken. Yeah. And I, I went, I just looked at her and I was like, I'm going to change this because I realized I was arguing and not listening to her heart and I was not taking in any new information. Yeah. And uh, and so that's what happens is we think sometimes because we can just keep going with the hammer that somehow we're like, we're, we're bringing truth to light and really what we're doing is we're just hurting people in the process. Yeah. And, and, and what are the chances of that actually being a good strategy? Like mathematically, like what are the chances? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> at, yeah. Like let's say 15, you hit that point in life, you're like, yeah, I know it all. Like I'm right. super smart. I heard a guy once, he was the lead pastor of the church I worked at in San Diego. He said something, I just thought it was so good. He's like, when we started this church, they were in a season of change and growth and trying to, you know, cultural relevancy, all these challenges. And he said something, he's like, when we started, he's like, I know less now than I thought I knew when we planted this church. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> okay. And that would on the surface look like you would think, oh, that guy failed. But what he's saying is oh, an incredibly so successful statement, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah go, it go really ahead. is. There's so much power in that. There's freedom in that. It's like, I'm really comfortable. And mind you, this guy, is in the back half of his ministry, getting ready to retire. He was in his late 60s. And it just hit me so hard. He's like, I know less now than I thought I knew when I was 30 years old when we For got sure. into this venture. Because it's like, yeah, mathematically, what are the chances at 15, 16, 17 that you know it all? Right. That you yeah. that you nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> like I have all the good information. I have all the right. You don't. You know? right. And so the idea of being like, well, yeah, now you know it's done. There's nowhere for you to go. Yeah. You know? And and you can tell people like that really quick too. So you see on, on Facebook, social media. When people are engaging from that perspective, they're going to use big, dramatic statements without asking questions. Exaggerated pivot, statements, right? Exa yeah, yeah, massive statements. Then they're going to pivot really quickly the moment you bring in something up new of like, hey, well, what about this perspective? Well, actually, it's about this. And all of a sudden, you guys quickly, it's like, okay, you're not here. Yeah. You know? Yeah, when we were talking about this, and and, uh, and I probably need a quick prefacing everything that way because obviously we've talked about so many topics. Sure, yeah. But you, you said the thing that made me laugh is when, when you take the time to really lay out a really persuasive argument. So whether it's you're, you're typing it up or you're sharing an article or sharing a video and and then someone's response basically is no. It's the equivalent of just like, no. No, and you just go, <laughs> like in that moment you realize they didn't even engage this. Yeah. Like they're, they're not listening. They're just they're just preparing their next argument. And, and we all, we sense that because we've all done it. I've is done, where yeah. you are just, you're listening to prepare an argument versus listening to hear. You know, so like in the scriptures, James says that we need to be quick to listen, slow to speak. And, and but he's not talking about just hearing so that we can speak because literally he says slow to speak. He's saying listen to understand someone. Listen to, honestly, I would say in our culture, to love them well. If I don't hear why something bothers you, then I'm not, again, I'm not taking in new information and I'm just wounding you. Yeah. And so like right now with all these hot topics of, and things we'll cover, racism, politics, yeah. um, and, and so many, even with the pandemic and yeah. all these opinions, if someone posts something that's very emotional to them, you should pause and try to process why this is emotionally hitting them, mm. why they are feeling that way. But you will never do that if you don't have a, a culture of learning that I want to keep taking in new information. Yeah, yeah. The moment your heels are dug into the ground and you've put your flag down and you've decided like this is right, this is good, this is what I believe, I'm right. You you miss that. You miss the opportunity to empathize with somebody. You miss the opportunity mm -hmm. to grow from that empathy. And also, it's really bad conversation. So as a millennial, <laughs> <laughs> like it's not nobody wants to talk to that person. You're For not sure. fun at parties. You know what I mean? Like, For sure. Yeah. Like, no, no one wants to engage with you. This is like as a as a millennial, I'm not a big fan of people, you know, crapping on millennials all the time because it's very easy, right? You know. But that being said, there's something I'll never forget. It. I was I was sitting in a in in one of the rooms here at the church over in the branch. I was watching three young people talk. It was the craziest conversation I've ever seen in my entire life. I'll never forget it. <laughs> I literally stopped them and I had to explain like, guys, can I just tell you what I just saw happen? There were literally three independent people having conversations with only themselves in the same room. <laughs> so, right. so someone would say something like a thought. The other person would say something, nothing to do with what they just said. They say, yeah, yeah. And then they'd say their thing. So you're saying, you know, you know quick to listen, slow to speak, the exact opposite. They're mm -hmm. not even taking in what they just said. They're focusing on what's my next move. Right. What's the next thing I'm going to say? And the third person would say, yeah, super. And then they'd say their thing. Almost three separate individual conversations because they're not, they're not waiting just to just yeah. to, to hear what they have to say. They're not wanting to even engage in it. They want their voice to be heard. And there's something that you told me, this was really early on. So this is probably four or five years ago. We were in the old building. And you said that you found a lot of freedom and at times just saying like, I don't have an opinion on that. Mm -hmm. 
and that blew my mind if you just right. saying like like I don't know like like someone would ask you what's your opinion on this really controversial thing like I don't, I don't have one like I'm and that know, shocks people and I remember that conversation with you because you were even shocked like you, you blew my mind like, I just remember like but that's you, that yeah. went back so even a, a quote it's been credited to Joyce Meyer which uh, I know some people feel differently I don't know that she actually said it because I can't find it anywhere sure yeah but it was basically the idea of if you don't have authority in a situation you don't need to form an opinion. Dang, and and I remember being like, oh, there's so much wisdom to that. And I have a family. My family, we we love talking about hot topics. Yeah, we yeah. love debating. We love discussing. And we're we're close, so it's not for us. It's not a divisive thing. But I remember like at times, like whether it be my mom or someone else, going, "What's your opinion on this?" And I just realized I don't have an opinion, so I don't want to even talk about it because I don't need yeah. to form an opinion. Right. And it was very freeing in that situation. But, but I also recognize, like, so we have in our culture, uh, we're conditioned to form opinions because of social media. Right. So with, with Twitter and Facebook and things like that, we, uh, and I, I'm sure a lot of people are this way, you experience something in life and immediately your brain starts to form the post. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Where like, yeah, 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 yeah. like I had it today. I Man, I'm, uh, oh, took my, my dog into the vet today and uh, it, we're in the still social distancing. So you have to call in, they come get your animal and they take it, take them in. So the, the lady pulls up next to me and she, the person comes out and says, Eric, who are you here for? And she said, um, Lucifer is here to get fixed. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was like, Lucifer, you know, like the what name a crazy of, of Satan group of words all in a row. <laughs> I know. So I look over, funny thing was it was a cat, which I thought, okay, that makes sense now. But, um, yeah. but but in the moment, my mind was processing how I could post this on social media. Yeah. And, and how can I do this and be funny? How can I do this and be creative? And then I also thought, but what if someone knows this person? Then now I look like I'm making fun of them. Like I went through this whole process and then I didn't post anything. Yeah. And But I just thought, how weird is it that I'm living life with through the, the lens of I have to communicate all my opinions, all my experiences through social media. So the danger of that is we're conditioning generations to form opinions really without education. So that one's a simple thing. I could have made a joke and, and honestly probably not offended people, but in other critical areas, we're forming immediate, and I'll say it, uneducated opinions, yeah. and then we're just posting it out there, not even realizing that uneducated opinion could be wounding someone. Yeah, because the Because uh, other people on, on either side of it have very deep emotions that are attached to it. And I'm guilty of this. I'm not saying like I've nailed this oh, right, because yeah. I've had meetings in the last couple of weeks with people who through some of my posts on some of the critical issues going on, they're saying, this is how I'm processing it. Yeah. This is how it, it's, it, I'm registering it. And I'm saying to them, and I think it's even hard for them to believe, I'm saying to them, I'm enjoying this meeting because it's helping me understand communication even better. Oh yeah, And, and I, I think, again, that's the heart that I'm trying to get all of us to understand is we all make mistakes, we all fail, but we have to have a heart that says, I could be wrong. I, I could yeah. do better. I, you know, another way to word it. I could do better. So show me. Yeah. So I grew up with this very specific feeling and, and culture where everything about your life needed to be presented and packaged and branded. So like when I was in junior high, MySpace happened, which was really cool, which is really cool in the moment where you can literally build your own website all about you, mm -hmm. which in hindsight it's crazy, but you literally yeah. build a website all about yourself. When people go to it, a song plays, your picture comes up, you can make the background. I remember like, I remember, I literally remember debating in my head what I wanted it to be. I loved hip hop. So I thought like, do I go that route? <laughs> or do I have that vibe? I also, I also like emo music and I wear tight pants sometimes. So I had to go that route. <laughs> you know what I mean? This, this is like 2005, 2006. So I remember, I remember having this internal debate and what it taught me early on is like, you have to have your life packaged, ready to go and branded in the sense where it's going to be palatable and cool. Mm -hmm. And, and that has continued even that's even that culture has gotten deeper as things go on. Instagram happens where, where you need your pictures just to be looking just mm -hmm. right. And it, you, you'll literally go to people's walls and it feels like a, like a catalog company for some clothing line sometimes. Yeah. Know? Uh, and it, and I think the problem with that is it's made us feel like this sense of manufactured fake urgency. You know, it's not real. Like right. no one's actually putting that expectation on my life. Yeah. No one needs me to have profound thoughts about everything. It's mm -hmm. this fake manufactured sense of like, I have to have something profound to say and I needed to fit in this prepackaged yeah. thing that is Michael Jock morning on the internet. Right. And I think it's giving people this fake, this fake sense of almost not entitlement, but just like, there's a lack of humility there. Sure. Rather than saying like, what if I just listen for like a month and just like, just stop mm -hmm. inundating the world with my thoughts? Like, what if I just listened? Like, what if I just asked a whole bunch of questions and let right. that be enough? 
Um, but but we, I, specifically my generation, and really it's hard to talk for really just specifically me is all I can really speak to with any kind of authority. But for myself, that's like a, a continued challenge just to sink myself and cover myself in humility and just say, just ask like a whole bunch of questions because the consequences, you know, really what you're just talking about is this, like you form these opinions and they're not informed opinions. They might not be good opinions, but mm-hmm. you deliver them like they are. Right. You can wound a lot of people. You can hurt your witness. You can disqualify yourself from witnessing to somebody, yeah. which is devastating. You can make your brothers and sisters in Christ feel outcast, like you don't care for them, like you don't mm-hmm. love them, like you're not listening to them because I have to have my packaged really clean statement. Yeah. And, and I think the, the danger with the, the branding concept that unfortunately happens is because a lot of people fall in one of two political parties that that also yeah. becomes a part of their brand. And so they have to keep speaking the talking points. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to say something that I, I might regret, <laughs> but I think it needs to be said. We can edit it out of it. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. If it gets too fired up, we'll just cut that part out and be like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I never said that. Um, but it's, I think in this latest season with the pandemic and with uh, the race tension, that what I'm seeing is, and, and again, I'm, I'm saying this bluntly here, is that I've realized even within the Christian community that people are taking less of a lead from the Bible and their pastors uh, versus they're taking their lead from news channels yeah. and bloggers and people who have YouTube pages and stuff. Yeah. And, and that was honestly, it was kind of devastating for me as a pastor is to realize that I can say something using the scriptures and someone will argue with me, ignoring the fact that I just used scripture. Yeah. And, and they'll give me a talking point from uh, whether it be a news channel, from a political party, or like I said, a blogger, a video blogger. And, and I'm saying, but, but, I, but I'm, I'm quoting scripture this here. This is the word of God. Yeah, this is the word yeah. of God. I'm like, God said this. I didn't say this alone. And, and yet not getting that same interaction or that same weight. And, and that was sad to me because like even the reality that just about every mainstream pastor that I know who has a social media presence, is all saying the exact same message, and yet for some reason that doesn't have the weight that news channels can have. And that's yeah. that's because people have fallen into a category and they're saying, I have to, in order to protect myself, my brand, my rights, this is what it must look like. Yeah. And, and one of the dangers, like, because all the topics that we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at it from a biblical perspective too. And so I kind of wanna bring this home and talk about that for a moment. When Jesus was in the, the last moments with his disciples, what we would call the Last Supper, he, he tells them this information, I'm leaving you, for whatever reason, he said it many times before, for whatever reason, they finally got it, they're devastated. His comfort to them is he says, but here's the good news, I'm gonna ask the Father and he's gonna send a helper, another. Um, he's gonna send the Holy Spirit to be a part of your life. But what Jesus says to them is, the Holy Spirit's gonna do these incredible things in your life. And he says, he's going to, because he even tells them, like, this is a, a weird statement. He goes, I'm leaving you, but I still have so much to teach you. Yeah. But then he tells them, he goes, here's what's going to happen. The Holy Spirit is going to be the one who teaches you. He says the Holy Spirit's going to be the one that guides you into all truth. And then he says the Holy Spirit's going to convict you of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. So here's this powerful image that he tells his disciples. Basically, I'm going to paraphrase it in, in my language. He says, you're not a finished product. You, wow. you have to yeah. keep learning. And you have to keep changing because that concept of conviction is there's something wrong in your life that needs to change. Mm. The concept of new information is you are ignorant right now and you need new information. And the the concept of guiding you into all truth is the idea that there is truth that you have yet to discover. And so this idea of Jesus that is such a comfort that he's giving to his disciples is, I'm going to keep working on your life. If we stop that process and say, like, I'm no longer taking in new information, then what's gonna happen is we have to find our identity and our security in something or someone. And so many people are allowing political parties to shape their understanding of behavior, of belief, and as a result, that becomes their foundation. But the problem of it is, like we've seen in the pandemic, it doesn't hold up, but also it doesn't reflect Jesus. And people need to understand that. I'm saying this bluntly, but political parties are not a Christian thing. No, the, yeah. the ultimate goal of whatever party you're affiliated with is to make your country better. Yeah. The ultimate goal is to better the country, not to advance the kingdom of God. Now, you might feel like your political party leans closer than the other to, to God, and that's your right to believe that. Yeah, sure. But the kingdom of God is a unique and separate thing that is the number one priority. Right. And so th- this is the heart that we have in this video that we're doing these upcoming ones is to help people understand when there's a conflict between the word of God 
and something else in your, your thinking or behavior, the Word of God has to win. Yeah. And so we have to have that mindset, okay, I could be wrong, and so therefore, I'm just going to open up my mind and heart. Because what's the worst case? The worst case is you were wrong, you gain new information, and now you're right. You're just right all over again. You're right all over again. You're yeah. in a stronger position. And, and that's really our heart. Yeah, yeah, right. for sure. Like, here's why that's so massively important to me. It's, it's, it's tribalism. So we as people feel this weird sense of needing to feel like you're a part of, like, like the collective. Or, sure. You know, or even feel like there are people like-minded people. And you can see that in social, stu- in like social studies, even funny videos. I remember seeing a video once, probably in high school, of um, people they got like 50 people on the same page. Like when the stranger walks in, everybody's going to duck at the same time to see if that person would too. (laughs) And hundred percent of the time they do. There's just something about being a person that just, you want to feel like you're in the majority or you want to feel like you're with like-minded people, whatever the case might be. Have you seen that video where they're like in a waiting room and people just start randomly standing? Yeah. Basically the same concept. And so people that come in that aren't part of it and they start standing too. And crazy. Yeah. 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 Unbelievable. (laughs) I just think that's a, that's a natural thing for humans. And the problem with that is it also leads us to, this sense of tribalism where, well, now that I've defined that I'm a conservative or a liberal, whatever feels conservative or feels liberal is where I'm going to mm-hmm. camp at. Right. That's where I'm in. Now, at times, that's going to defy the word of God, period. It sure. doesn't matter. If you think, well, I think the conservative party is more like Jesus and the liberal party is more like Jesus. It doesn't matter. At one point or another, that's going to go against what the word for of sure. God says because it's imperfect. Mm-hmm. Because for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Because they're built on man-made institutions with man-made ideas and that's where it's coming from. So anytime that that conflicts with the word of God, but you continue to dig your heels in that moment, you're, it, it's idolatry. You're saying more than holiness, more than my relationship with God, more than the commands of God, more than he would want of me, I'm now in this camp and this is what I believe. Yeah. So you, you can find that by justifying crazy things or justifying an action that your political party agrees with and saying, well, I don't like that, but I guess I'll, I'll say it's okay because I'm a part of this camp. Mm-hmm. That goes for either side. And it's just so dangerous because you're literally saying, more than I want Jesus, more than I want what he would have for me, I want that. You right. know? And that's why this is such a massively important conversation. I think going forward, that's going to be the call to action for all of us. Is like what you and I have agreed to before we even started this. We're both going to go into every single conversation with this in mind. Like, I could be wrong. Yeah. That's how we're going to, every single person. And we're we going to bring in other guests yeah. to have conversations with us where we're going to say, okay, tell us. Tell us your perspective. Yeah. And and we're not necessarily going to create, try to make it equal one perspective and another perspective. We're not trying to do a debate. We're just saying, here, come in and share your heart. We, yeah. we want you to be heard. And so we're going to be talking race. We're going to be talking politics. We're going to be talking with uh, with medical professionals. We're going to, a bunch of different things yeah. just to open our minds to this reality. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's going to be the call to action to everyone listening as well. Whether you're a part of our church, not a part of our church, we all need to have this mentality of every time we listen, every time we engage in these conversations, if I could be wrong. I even told you a couple of days ago, maybe it was yesterday, I've ha- I have this like new policy when I engage with someone on Facebook to highlight the thing I agree with first because mm-hmm. it almost appro- appropriately it sets my mind in the right place. So let's say somebody says something that I really disagree with, I'll try to find something that I that we do see eye to eye. Okay, yeah, no, that's a super good point. Yeah. Start there and then continue with like, here's another perspective and it, and it helps you frame things appropriately. That's going to be the call to action to, to people listening to us, to the guests we have on, is this idea of we're going to be respectful, we're going to listen well, we're going to love each other well, and we're going to really hope to be proved. I remember a guy named uh, Josh when I was in college told me, I enjoy the process of be proving wrong now. It makes me happy because, I, like, like you said I 100% earlier, agree with that. I just feel like I'm smarter now. I have the better idea. I, I'm hungry for correction. I'm hungry for discipline, even from yeah. like the spiritual authority I've allowed in my life. I'm hungry for my wife to tell me where I've messed up because now I get to be better. For sure. You, you know, know, I used to hear people say that when I was younger, that were spiritually mature. And honestly, I felt like it was almost disingenuous. I yeah. thought, nah, nobody likes correction. Yeah. No one, nobody likes hard. reprint. Yeah. It is hard because it's, there is that moment of embarrassment when someone corrects you. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just like, ooh, I was doing something wrong. But I can honestly say I enjoy it now. Not not correction because I don't love the sure. idea of being wrong, but I love the process of learning. I like I, I love when I can talk to my wife and she can say, you, you're a better husband. Like you're a better husband this year than you were last year, which the implication is I was doing something falling short last year. Right. But I love that. I love that as a pastor. I love that as a leader. I love that as a Christian where God convicts and then we change something. But here's another element. I want you just to talk about just for a second, because I think it's hit both of us in order to have this mindset, we have to be willing to surrender some of the labels that we've once embraced. Because one of the funny things is people, 
assume our political stance on things, you and I, because yeah. of some of our posts. Yeah. And so like some people, I'll, I'll just say it. Some people think like, oh, Matt's left leaning yeah. or Michael could be left leaning. And, uh, and the reality is um, they don't know how I vote. They don't yeah. know like if I'm left leaning or right leaning because I don't, I don't talk about that. But the fact is none of my political opinions are shaped just by politics. It's shaped by the Bible. Mm. And so the reason I say that is some people might give me a label and say, I'm, I'm left leaning. Some people might say I'm right leaning, but the truth of it in my perspective is I'm Christ leaning. I'm leaning toward Christ. Man, that's so good. It, but, but we have to be willing to, to go, okay, I'm going to look at something I once embraced as a, a great thing, a, a political party, and realize there might be, like you just said, there might be some things that don't align with God. Am I comfortable to take a step back and say, okay, some people that, that connect to me, they might get frustrated with me. They yeah. might now want to, right. to turn on me and say, oh, you're just falling into the yeah. trap and, and all this. Yeah. To the media, to fake news, and you're just letting them inform your for decisions sure. or your beliefs. You know, I, like I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll speak kind of plainly, uh, a little bit bluntly on this topic because I think it's important. I think that, you know, it's so easy to build this us versus them narrative, which in the kingdom of heaven, there's no place for it. Right. It just, it, there's no place for that there. There's us and there's people that we want to be us. We want to get them saved. That's that's it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> pretty simple, there's us right? And hopefully future us's. Like we yeah, want to get them in there. You absolutely. Know? But what we do, um, especially when it comes to politics, and this is where it's so di- or anything, any divisive issue, mm-hmm. this is what we do. We paint this narrative that it's us versus them, and I think that's so damaging because we're losing sight of the fact that uh, let's say Democrats and Republicans for just a quick, very easy example, um, very different philosophies, but aiming for the same thing. Both of them, we were just talking about this out, out there in the, in the office. Both of them want a safe and thriving America. Some of their ideas are terrible. Some of them are good. To, the idea of lump summing them or to buy or sell this narrative like, well, that's just all evil or they're manipulative. You're, you have disqualified yourself from ever even engaging in a conversation right. with them once you take that stance of like, sure. they're all crooks. They're all evil. They're all greedy. They're all... Yeah, I mean, we've, know, we've literally seen be. posts this week that say... All Republicans are racist. Yeah. And we've seen Seriously. all Democrats are Nazis. Like we've literally seen Isn't this being crazy? shared over and over. And you're thinking, if you take a moment, take a step back and, and look at that, you go, there's no way that's true. No, just like mathematically, it's not true. Right. I know a lot of conservatives who are phenomenal. I know a lot of Democrats who are phenomenal. I know. And, and so you look at it and go, what is that? Well, those are two lies. Yeah. yeah. And so you've demonized someone. And we're going to talk about that in one of the future videos. But yeah. you've now demonized someone and, and you've lost any ability to speak to them. You've lost really even ability for yourself to hear any good that they might share yeah. uh, that can open and change your mind because, again, you've just closed down and said, yeah. evil, they're wrong, they're right. bad. And now, yeah, what, exactly what you just said. I, I can no longer grow from that person or that experience because I've already bought into the narrative that it's me versus you. Mm-hmm. I think that's silly. All right, so I'm going to end with one final question and yeah. put you on the spot. I mean, just to give us an example. Can you give us an example of an area that you've changed your mind in the last three, four years? So now you're, you know, you're, you're a functioning adult, you're sure. a pastor, you're sure, married, yeah. you have your father. Um, what has this been something that you go, you know what, a few years ago I felt a certain way and now I realize I was wrong? Sure. So this is going to be vulnerable because I'm going to talk about a specific issue that could be polarizing, but I'd ask anybody listening to give me the benefit of the doubt and know that with the next amount of time I might change my mind again. Sure. We could be wrong. Yeah. So don't, as I say this, don't say, oh, well, now I don't trust Michael and his opinions because he believes that and I disagree. Yeah. Be comfortable in saying, oh, that, I, th- I think that's a bad opinion, but I respect you. So really easy example, I was just talking with Kenny about this. Um, he works here at the tree, but he, uh, um, I used to be staunch, staunch anti-gun. Like there's no reason, I think I even put on my Twitter once, which I've since deleted. This is like, you know, mm-hmm. seven years ago. Nothing holy could come out of a gun. I was so passionate about that, yeah. that principle of like, Owning a gun is dumb. They're built for death. Jesus is about life. I just thought it was so silly. And then, I, then I had a moment. And I'm not going to go. I'm not going to get too lost in the whys and hows because I don't want to even engage in the debate within myself right now. But there was a moment. I think it was the Paris attacks. I remember talking. We were. At, yeah. I remember what restaurant we were at. We were talking about this. The Paris attacks happened, and I just remember having. And I had just gotten married too, um, and I remember having this weird, deep conviction of like, man, that may have been different if there could have been someone there to protect that from happening. And it felt mm-hmm. like this weird responsibility of now I'm married. If someone were to come into my home, am I equipped to help, you know, protect mm-hmm. and, you know, and steward over what I have? And I had a change in my mind where I'm like, man, I was once this and now that I'm this. And at first that can be embarrassing. Mm-hmm. I put on Twitter. I put on the internet. Right. You know what I mean? Like yeah, nothing holy yeah. could come out of a gun. And then now, two years ago, I found myself at a skeet shoot in our church. 
<laughs> shooting a guns gun. are awesome yeah like with brother and i even, I even joked with kenny I, I i got it i remember i hit like the first clay pigeon i was like i get it <laughs> this, is, this is pretty cool like like but and here's the thing one day i might find myself on another side of that and say you know i read a new thing i heard a new sermon i saw a, a passage of scripture that changed my mind and now i feel something differently about it but being able to liberate myself from saying when someone asked you were so anti-gun now what's up mm-hmm. just being like sure like I learned something new. Yeah, we have this weird dynamic where think about like politics for a minute, where po- politicians they'll get slammed for changing their mind. I know you're a flip flopper. Back in the '70s, you voted this way. Now you're voting this way. It's like I know. So so and if you don't, all that tells me is like you went like 30 years without learning anything new. I know. I, I feel the you same know? way. Like they they bring it up. You used to feel this way, and I think. Are you saying that as a put down or a compliment? Yeah. Because in my mind, like that person evolved, that person changed an opinion. They got like new they took information it, and you, right. And, you and, you and culture has else. changed. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. For me, the biggest one that I've changed on is I used to be pro death penalty, and I'm a hundred percent not now. Yeah. And I remember as a kid arguing it, like in the church world, like, like the cheesy things we do, like let's let's have biblical debates. And I remember sure, like in yeah. youth group, we would debate the topic, and I was always pro death penalty, like yeah. to the end. And, uh, and I just realized like that does not align with a pro life. When I just say pro life, like for life stance and, and even on a political side, like there's a chance that someone could be put to death. That's actually innocent. Like that seems crazy to me. Yeah. If you watch the movie, just mercy or I, just mercy or just mercy. I don't know how, what the, yeah. how they're wording it. Um, but it just kind of changed your perspective. But even before that, I was just realized like I, if I am the heart of God and embracing that God is for life. Man. And, and so I had to change yeah. my perspective on that. And and I remember like even talking to a friend and they about it and saying like, oh yeah, I'm not that way anymore. And they're like, oh, I remember when you were in high school. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm not who I was in high school. Right. right? Thank, thank goodness. Thank goodness. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I look at uh, who so I was in high levels. school and it's yeah. like, man, I'm very glad that I'm not the way that I was in high school or else I'd have For a sure. lot of really bad, ill-informed ideas that I felt really confident about. Right. It goes back sure. to what Harry said in San Diego where he said like yeah, as a 70, almost a seven year old man saying like, I know less now that I thought I knew a long time ago. You right. know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I'm looking forward. So some of the upcoming topics, we're gonna talk about um, how we can critique things and how that's not a bad thing. We're gonna talk about racism. We're gonna yeah. talk about politics. Um, we'll probably talk about specific issues. We might talk about abortion and homosexuality, yeah. uh, different hot topics. We're gonna bring in different guests and uh, just engage them, ask questions, um, be vulnerable. Even the chance of asking questions that in and of themselves sound politically incorrect because we're just going to say, hey, it's a safe environment for us to, to wrestle through ignorance and to just hear another perspective. And we probably won't agree uh, with everyone we bring in and we probably won't oh, agree with sure. each other yeah. at times, but that's okay. So yeah. I'm excited. Yeah, and, me too. Uh, me too. And that final call to action, what I would tell people, I could be wrong. That's how we're going to do it. So mm-hmm. if you're listening, you're going to hear these topics and you might say like, oh, that sounds intense. It becomes yeah. less intense when you go into this mentality. Yeah, yeah. We could be wrong. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.